joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. In heaven and nature sing, in heaven and nature sing. Good morning and Merry Christmas. We are here to celebrate His birth, His death, His resurrection, and I might add, His coming again. Would you stand as we praise the Lord of the earth this morning? And Merry Christmas. So, how many of you have already done all the thing and all of that? All right, so most of you have. So, I can preach as long as I want. <laughs> One of you. I expect somebody to go, woo! It's excited, but it's good to see everybody this uh, beautiful Lord's Day that we celebrate the birth, as Brother Stan said, of our Savior Jesus and celebrate his life and his death and his resurrection. And hopefully soon return. Amen? Wouldn't we, what church, wouldn't we love to see the Lord Jesus Christ return in 2022? Yeah, I said 2022. I know you're like, well, pastor, there's only a week left. I know that. Uh, So thank you for being out this morning. Just one quick reminder. All I have is remember next Sunday, we are obviously meeting, but there'll be no encourage group slash Sunday school. So we'll meet here at 10 o'clock again. Uh, so they're just kind of so next week ten o'clock for worship only, and we'll and Wednesday night we'll go on as normal. Uh, is that right, brothers? That's right. that's right. Somebody tell me. I'm looking for somebody that knows more than me, and that's a lot of you. So, so um, Wednesday night everything will go on as normal. So let's pray and continue to worship our Savior Jesus. Father, we are grateful for this day that 
we celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And God, I, I'm just thankful that I know the reason for this season and the people in this room know the reason. That you have enlightened our hearts and our minds to understand the gospel and to understand the magnitude of this day. And God, is many in this room will be gathering with their families today and in this next week, may you allow us to have the opportunity to remind our friends and our families that this season is a, it has a greater significance than what the media and the culture of America declares it to have. It, it's so significant that the Son of God has come to dwell with man. And so may we use this opportunity to declare your glory and declare your majesty and declare your praise to all that will hear. And God, I'm grateful for these that have gathered, and I pray that our worship today would be pleasing to you. And it's in your Son's incredible name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Brother Stan. Amen. Would you stand once again? May Jesus Christ continue to be exalted in our praises today. He is the reason we're here. seated. Come on up, band. Jesus was Lord even at his birth. Amen? Amen? He was Lord in the manger. I won't preach. That's his job. But I will read scripture as they're getting prepared. This will set up this song very nicely. This song, the name of this song is Behold. We see that word used in Scripture. For example, Luke chapter 2. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news. You're watching online. Jesus came with good news. And good news for you. And good news for us. I bring you good news of great joy which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, 
There has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then we see once Jesus becomes an adult, John the Baptist said, he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then another John writes in 1 John, Behold, how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God.
There we go. You know, for how, every time something like that happens, I think about all the uh, generations of preachers and worship leaders and song leaders who who sang and led without any means of uh, mag- magnification, I guess is what it'd be. And I, I just can't help but think about what their voices had to be like and how, how I, I know how tired I am on some Sundays, and I can't imagine these guys that did this fully just on their um, on their own voice, and so it's just an amazing thing. So anyway, uh, Galatians chapter 4, uh, we're going to look at the Advent, we're going to look at, um, so let me just tell you something about the Apostle Paul, there's two passages that are, that are that he uses that are incredible passages, one's in Philippians chapter 2, uh, when he talks about the incarnation of Christ, and he uses Philippians 2 as an example for how we should be living. And then in Galatians chapter 4, we have this, what really the, the, the birth narrative, the Christmas story, in the midst of him talking about the law. He's talking about how Jesus had come to fulfill the law and, and set us free from the law. And then, yeah, this, this document just got deleted. We'll see what happens. Wow. I don't know if I don't know what's going on. If the enemy doesn't want y'all to hear this, or I don't know. Anyway, uh, we'll see what happens. And then, in the midst of talking about the law, he he gives us the birth narrative in Galatians chapter four, and about how what this first advent, what it was, what it brought for us, and how come we should celebrate the birth of Christ. And so, Galatians chapter four. I'll pick up the reading there, in verse four. Uh, and we'll read down through verse 7. I think Brother Stan read this last night as we celebrated here together. It says, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth His Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Let us pray. Father, we come in the incredible name of Jesus. And we come today because Jesus came. He came to... It's good. You taking it away from me? Why are you <laughs> He came to set us free uh, from the penalty of sin, from the penalty of the law. And today, may we celebrate uh, the advent of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in His glorious name we pray. Amen. I just want to show you a few uh, things, a few ideas, a few principles that we learn from this passage about the advent. The first thing is this first advent was an anticipated arrival. And what I mean by that, it was anticipated. It had been predicted for hundreds of years. Isaiah spoke of it uh, 750 years before the birth of Christ. And notice what it says here in verse 4. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, while we don't understand the fullness of God's parameters Here's what we do know and what God is telling us when He said in the fullness of time. It was the perfect time for Jesus to be born. Now, i was been thinking about that. There's a lot of people say, well, you know, it, was, it had to be during the Roman Empire because Rome had invented the crucifixion. They had, had created this road system. And so we, we, we tend to try to figure out, you know, wh- why He came when He came. Uh, I will tell you this, we know this. We know that he was born in the right era, in the right century, in the right decade, on the right continent, in the right nation, at the exact right time. In the right town, in the right city, and at the exact moment. His birth, it was not a day early, and it was not a day late, but it was at the fullness of God's timing. And so when we celebrate Christmas, we're really celebrating the sovereignty of God and his control over all things. Matthew chapter 2 Verse 1, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, in the days of Herod the king, the Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod heard this, they were troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him, gathering together the chief priests and the scribes, and he inquired of them, 
where the Messiah was to be born. And they said, in Bethlehem of Judea. And so they knew. They, they knew the exact city. This little small town of Bethlehem was supposed to be the one who produced this king, this Messiah. Micah chapter 5, he predicts this again. The prophet says there will be a child and he is going to come for, for Israel. And so the first advent, the coming of Christ, should have not, it shouldn't have caught everybody by surprise. It really shouldn't. It'd be like his second advent. There are going to be people surprised when Jesus returns. And the scripture tells us, church, don't be surprised. Don't be caught off guard. You can look around and understand. And you, you say, well, pastor, I'm not, a, I'm not a student of end times. We don't have to be a student of end times to understand we're closer than we've ever been to the return of Jesus. And when he returns, and whether you believe in a rapture or you don't believe in a rapture, which I happen to, but whether you do or you don't, you should not be surprised when it happens, when Jesus returns, because the scriptures has revealed he's coming. And here's some things that are going to happen. And so they shouldn't have been caught off guard, yet they were. I mean, for the Hebrew, the Jew, this was the most anticipated moment in their history, and they didn't even see it. Can you think about that? Can you imagine anticipating something for thousands of years, and then when it happens, you don't even recognize it, you don't even see it? But yet it was predicted, and they did not see it. And so this first advent, it was highly anticipated, but it was also miraculous. Now look what it says again here in verse 4. When the fullness of time come, when, time, when, when God's timetable was complete, when, when, when Mary was full, full, it was time for the baby to come. Look what it says. God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Well, what is so miraculous about this? Well, the first thing I would make note of, it was miraculous because the Son of God came to dwell with man. This wasn't a false God. This was the true living God. Philippians chapter 2, I mentioned it a moment ago. Have this attitude which was in your, also in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. Although He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. Meaning Jesus came, the Son of God, who had always... People sometimes get confused and they think that Jesus didn't exist till the birth. He'd always existed. He would all, he'd always been in heaven. He, 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 he divested himself. He, he, he left heaven's worship and he became like man. He took on flesh, which meant he was, he was limited to time and space for the first time in his life. He was limited to time and space to some degree. He never quit being God, but he was God robed in flesh. That's a miracle that the Son of God would come to be like man. The second miracle was that the Son of God was born of a woman. I think Brother Stan alluded to this last night. But he wasn't born to just any woman, was he? He was born to the one woman in history. Now I know there's some, there's some face that want to worship this woman. And, and obviously we're grateful for Mary. We're grateful for her part in the gospel. But she does not deserve our worship. Amen? Uh, she, she might deserve, you know, some... Um, she might serve as an encouragement to us as a faithful servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. But she was one, just a person who God has used to bring about the gospel. Matthew chapter 1 verse 24. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did... And did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary to be his wife. But he kept her virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. Now a lot of people historically have had an issue with that because they're like, Well, pastor, a virgin can't give birth. And I would agree with that except for one exception in history. This, this exception when God's in control. Now, you know, as I think about that, some would say, Well, pastor, it's purely science. And so scientifically it's not possible but you know, in our society today, I'm, this is not my notes, this is kind of free. In our society today, they ought to believe it more than ever because science means nothing anymore. Those of you who understand what I'm talking about, you get where I'm at. They're like, well, it's all up to, so, you know, I'm just, just throwing that out, just saying. Isaiah chapter 9. And the cloak rolled in blood, and, and there will be a burning fuel for fire, and a child would be born to us, a son will be given. And the government shall rest upon his shoulders, and we will call his name Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Now notice, I've often thought this interesting. 
when people say that Jesus isn't God. Isaiah wrote 750 years before Jesus was born. He said, a child will be born to us, and this is who he'll be. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal father. And so even Isaiah's understanding that the Messiah is God, Prince of Peace, and there will be no end to the increase of his government or to the peace on the throne of David over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from, on, from then on forevermore. And in Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, which you, most of you know means God with us. And so this miraculous thing happened. The fact that the Son of God has come to dwell with man is a miracle. The fact that God has come and robed himself in flesh is a miracle. The fact that a virgin gives birth to a son is a miracle. The truth is everything about the first advent is miraculous. Now, we, we worship a miraculous God. So Christmas is simply a reminder that we serve a God of miracles. That is what, who he is. This passage also tells us why the advent happened. See, if God is complete and he needs nothing, and that's what the scripture teaches, teaches us, then why did he come visit his creation? It was simple. He came to save. He came to redeem. He came to reveal his loving kindness, his gracious nature. Notice what it says also here. Verse 4, he was born under the law so that he might redeem those who are under the law. And so what they're saying there is he became like us. He had to keep the law. Now, if you go back and you look at the Scriptures, what you'll understand that the law does something for all of us. It shuts us up as sinners, meaning none of us can keep the law. We can read the law. We can try to obey the law. But the law will eventually break all of us because we will all break the law. It's just like a good child. Some of you have some of, some of the most incredible children in the world. They're nearly perfect. But nearly is the word there. You think they've never, like Peyton over here, I bet he's almost never broken the law of his house. Almost never. But eventually the law of shame breaks him. Amen? And if, it, if the law of Shane doesn't break him, the law of Christina breaks him. Because eventually the law breaks us all, right? You can be great children, but eventually the law will break you. And because the law has broken us, it separated us from God, and, and we're condemned sinners, and the wages of sin is death, and we're slaves to sin, and we're trapped in sin. And, but the first advent provided redemption. The redemption to redeem means to purchase out of. If you've ever went to a pawn store, pawn shop, pawn store, pawn shop, if you don't know what those is, that's wonderful. But you, you, you sell them something for lesser value than it's worth, and then when you get your money, you go redeem it. Now, another way of putting that, some of you may remember layaway programs. Yeah, some, y'all don't know what that is. Some of, Sarah, some of your first presents were bought on layaway. Y'all remember the days when you, you could afford... $2 a week, or, and we'd go to Walmart, and we'd put stuff on layaway. And then there was that day, we, we had gotten enough money, and we could go redeem, we could go buy it out of slavery, Walmart slavery. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you can testify, some of you have never had to deal with layaway, but in my household, layaway was a, that's just the way we did Christmas. We'd start in May, but by December, we would redeem it. Well, God sent His Son to redeem. Jesus was born under the law to rescue those who are trapped under the law. He came to set the captives free. Galatians 3. But the Scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith is in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, keep being shut up. To the faith, which is to later to be revealed. You and I were trapped by the law. And we needed someone to rescue us. And only Jesus could do that. Only God could do that. 
Only God could die for the sins of the world. Only God's blood was sufficient to remove sin. That Romans chapter 6, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust, and do not go on presenting your members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members and instruments of righteousness to God. For sin will not be a master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And so what Jesus has done is He's come to redeem us from the law and set us free. For the, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You and I have been set free. And so Christmas, this first advent, is about the Son of God coming to redeem us. But it also does something else. It restores. It restores us. I mean, what's it restore? It restores our fellowship with God, our relationship with God. We, we just recently went through Genesis, and so we know this. See, prior to Adam's sin, Adam and God walked in an undisturbed fellowship. I can't understand it, but we know that the day after they, or the day they sinned, it says they heard him walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid themselves. And so apparently this was a common thing that was happening. And God and, and man, God and Adam would hang out together. I don't know what that looks like, but can you imagine hanging out with God? Hanging out with the man who created everything. And Adam and Eve, they had this, and yet when they sinned, everything changed. See, sin made a separation between man and God. And it remained there until Jesus. Now, the blood of the animals and goats, they, they would cover it over, but that separation still remained. There was only one who could remove that separation and could restore our relationship with God, and it was Jesus Christ. See, He came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He does not hear. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. So then it's through one transgression there resulted in condemnation to all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. For it's through one man's disobedience many were made sinners. Even so, through the obedience of one, the many were made righteous. This first advent was about a gift. It was about the gift of God's eternal Son to the world. Jesus is that gift. And as you unwrap presents this morning or tonight or this afternoon, they represent the Son of God. We give gifts as a reminder that He gave us the greatest gift. He came to restore our relationship with God. He came to, came to lay down His life for the sin of the world. And so the first advent was a miraculous, and it was predicted, and, and it brought about redemption. But it also brought something else. The first advent provided a new family. With Jesus, you get a brand new family. Now, I know, like every family... Uh, this time of year, everybody knows who Cousin Eddie is. And every family has a Cousin Eddie. Amen? I mean, it... well, maybe Sharon and I is our only family has a Cousin Eddie. We might call him Uncle Eddie or... Y'all got him? I know what, and if you don't raise your hand, you're probably the Cousin Eddie. Because, <laughs> I mean, that guy's got to be somewhere, right? And if you don't know who Cousin Eddie is, bless your heart. You, if you have missed some, some uh, uh, Christmas movie tradition. But notice what it says in verse 5. So that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might, re might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth his spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. And so this first advent brought redemption, and with this redemption comes a brand new family. And so Christmas is about Jesus making a way for us to be adopted. That's what it says here. 
God has sent forth His Son to adopt us. We become part of His family. John says, as many believed, He gave them the privilege to be called sons of God. You and I are now, not only are we related through Adam and Eve, because we're all cousins, but we're also related through the blood of Jesus Christ when we become adopted sons. And you know, every now and then somebody will say, foolishly say to someone who's adopted a, a child, well, which one are your natural children? They say, all of them. Because an adoption is a serious thing. When you adopt someone, the parents know what they're getting into. Now, i got to be honest with you. My mom and dad had no clue what they were getting when they got me. And Jane, you don't have to agree. They had no clue. They couldn't help it. But when you adopt someone, you know what you're getting. You, you've, you've watched the pattern of their life. You, you know the consequences. You know, you know that adoption is going to come with some, some struggles. But Jesus Christ has made it possible that God could adopt you, and he knew what he was getting into, and yet he still died for you. He sent his son to adopt us. And he sent his son to show us the father. We see this in verse 6. He sent his spirit in our hearts crying, Abba, Father. You know, when we talk about fatherhood and God being like a father, I'm often, when I read, people say, well, you got to be preachers, you got to be careful about that because fatherhood is often uh, misrepresented in society today because not all fathers are godly. And truth is, not all men who are saved that are godly are good fathers. And so fatherhood sometimes is not the best example for us to use in our society because most of us have made such a mess of fatherhood. But God is the perfect father. He's the father like we've never seen. He's, he's better than Beaver's father. Y'all don't remember Ward Cleaver. He's better, he's better than Andy Griffin. I don't remember the guy from Father's Knows Best. He's, met, he's better than Mike Brady. And these were all good TV fathers, I guess. No, he's much better than that. He came, he's a father that gives only good gifts. And he doesn't give bad gifts. When he disciplines, disciplines you, it's always good and righteous discipline. It's loving discipline. He doesn't discipline you out of anger. He disciplines you out of love. He gives you good gifts and not bad gifts. That's what Jesus has provided for you this Christmas. But he also gave you something else. In verse 7, he gave you an inheritance. You are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. He took you, he, he took you and I and he removed us from... the from being slaves to sin to being objects of righteousness. Now when God looks at us, He doesn't see a slave. He sees the righteousness of His beloved Son, Jesus. And it's hard for us to imagine, but I really believe Scripture teaches this. When God sees me, He sees His Son. He doesn't see Will's righteousness or Mike's righteousness or Brother Stan's righteousness. He sees the righteousness of His Son, Jesus. He didn't see our failures. He sees the complete work of Jesus on the cross, the resurrection. That ain't an incredible thought. Because let's just face it, we all look inwardly and from time to time and we, we feel like failures and maybe you feel like a failure today and you feel like, why? Well, I can't do this well, and I can't do that well, and I, I, I made this mistake, and I made that mistake. I want you to know something. When Jesus sees, when God sees you, He sees your son, His Son. That's an incredible thought. See, we worry about what everybody in the world thinks. That's what Instagram and Facebook and TikTok is all about, right? And is it this Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. There's so many social media, I can't keep up with them all. And we always want to present this image. There's those things called filters, right? You know, I've seen some people on those on, on Facebook and stuff, and I'd say, Sharon, who is that? And she'll go, well, that's so, so-and-so. I'm like, no, it's not. 
She goes, yeah, it is. It's a filter. I said, well, they don't even look like themselves. She goes, no, it's because they have a filter. Well, we have a supernatural filter. His name's Jesus. And when God sees us, He sees us through the lens of the empty tomb. That's why we celebrate Christmas. It's because of how God sees us. You have a new inheritance. For you've not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received a spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and get this, fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him so that we may also be glorified with Him. Jesus' first trip to earth, it brought redemption. It brought an eternal family for you and I. We have the perfect father, and we have a completely understanding elder brother. Our older brother, Jesus, understands everything we've ever going to go through. And he's not like some older brothers. He's without sin. He will never take our failures and use them against us. But he will always lift lift us up out of them. And we've been given an inheritance that you and I cannot fully fathom. We're heirs of Christ. There's a lot of talk about this person being the richest man in the world or this person being the richest family in the world. They all fall woefully short of the riches and treasures of our Father. And He withholds nothing from us. Everything He's going... He says we're joint heirs with Christ. We're, we're, we're co-sharers with the kingdom with Jesus Christ. <laughs> what about that? All the gifts that we give, let's just face it. So we were, we were, I was talking to somebody out in the foyer. And, Can y'all remember what you got last year for Christmas? Don't answer that. Because the answer is probably no. Unless you got a house or a car or something pretty significant or pots and pans. You might remember that. But otherwise, you probably don't remember. Because they all fall short of the inheritance and the gift of Jesus Christ. And so as we finish up this morning, I, I, I want us to, to just be reminded that Christmas really is about the Son of God. No matter what the media says, no matter what our culture says, it is about the Son of God coming to save you and me from sin and to bring us into His family and to share His inheritance with What kind of brother does that? What kind of brother says, everything that's mine is yours? Jesus. Jesus does that. That's why we're here this morning. Because we've been given an incredible gift this season. The Son of God. Who takes away the sins of the world. Now, Brother Sam, I'm going to throw you a curve. Can I do that? You okay with that? All right. So I love that song, Behold. And we've already heard it. Everybody's heard it now. I want to hear it again. But this time we're going to stand and sing with the band. Yeah, y'all come on up. Yeah, because isn't that why we're here? To behold the Lamb? To behold the King? And we can join them. Now again, you've heard it. You know the words. You probably heard it on Caleb at least 48 million times this Christmas season. To behold the Lamb. But if you might be here today and you say, Pastor, I've never received that gift. I've never called on Jesus to save me. What do I do? Well, it's simply that. You thank Him for His gift of life. You call on Him. You call on the name of Jesus and say, Jesus, would you save me from my sin? Like like that pastor said, you saved Him. His answer is yes. You say, Jesus, will you make me part of your family? His answer is yes. Jesus, will you give me an inheritance? His answer is yes. He's never said no to anyone who called unto Him for lordship. 
And so if you've never called on Jesus, I encourage you to do today. But church, if you have, then we must behold the glory of the only begotten Son of God. Amen? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come and we behold the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we say thank you for this incredible gift. This gift of redemption. This gift of restoration. This gift of adoption. This gift of inheritance. We say thank you. And may you receive our worship as we just simply want to behold your glory and your majesty. And it's in his glorious and great name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Stand with me.
Amen. Amen. Looking for one of our elders to pray for us to be dismissed. Brother Brad Montgomery, would you pray? And you guys go have a very Merry Christmas and behold the King of Glory. Brother Brad. Dear God, thanks for this time that we all come together and worship you and to, uh, to praise you for uh, sending your son to die on the cross for our sins and to be born um, on this world and to suffer in all ways that we have. Uh, 